Hello everyone, my name is Oscar and I am from the Coding Universe and today I'm going to be talking about how I made the Minefront port to the Lightweight Java Game Library. So in his 3D, 3D game Java programming, and I just said that all wrong, but yeah, that series, the Cherno made, he showed you how to create this. It's pretty impressive. But, yeah, the downside was it, it's software, and software is slow. Software rendering, that is. So now what I did is I took that, and I ported it to the Lightweight Java Game Library to create this. It looks a bit different, I know, but... The upside is that it's much faster to be... Um, on the Cherno's computer, it was actually 93 times faster than the original. And as you can also see, this is real 3D space, so I had to do some awful trigonometry to get this done. And I've also used a, um, a method called culling to um, obscure the sides that you can't see. So the back sides aren't rendered, they aren't sent to OpenGL. And that's because that makes the whole process faster. So now I already talked about it a bit, now I'm going to tell you, to tell you how I did this. Okay, the first thing you see up here is the PNG decoder from TWL. I used a different library to do this, um, you can google it. For me I, th I found it easier to implement this linear texture filtering so we have the blocky stuff. So that's why I use this. And let me see. So I used display list for rendering all this static geometry. So the floors, the ceiling, the walls, they're all display lists. That makes it really fast. And then we have this triangle here, which in fact is also rendered using display lists. So I'll show you the display lists. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah. So this is the example of a ceiling display list, and it's actually really simple, just um, only about eight lines of code to render the ceiling, as you can see here. So I started drawing quadrilaterals, I know they're deeper shaped, but I still use them nonetheless. So. Um, I basically went and put the textures on repeat so that, um, yeah, you know, I told you before that the texture coordinate of 1x, 1y was the bottom right or the upper right, one of those two. If you have 2x, 2y, the texture will repeat itself now. So, what I actually did is I created a variable called grid size and I multiplied that by 10 and then by the tile size. So I can actually go in my tile size. It's kind of weird because the smaller this number is, the larger the tiles. So if I add zero here, you can see that tiles are abnormally large. Yeah. So I did that for the static geometry. I also did the same for the walls and for uh, yeah, the, the um, floor. So I also used culling, as I said before, to increase performance by a few hundred frames per second. And what culling is, is it takes um, the front or the back or both sides of a polygon and then it renders one of them invisible. So it, it won't be sent to OpenGL at all. And you can do that by specifying what the front side is and what the back side is. And that's actually achieved by the um, how, you, how you send the vertices to OpenGL. So by doing that, you can actually specify what's the front and what's the back side. Um, I'm not going to explain the whole thing in detail right now. I, I guess Mr. Google can help you out on that one. But as you can see here... Um, yeah, here I enabled cull face, which is the culling. Okay. 
and then for the object I disabled culling because I want all the sides of the object to be shown and I don't want to worry about rendering some sides invisible. Okay, so that's that's working. And I also implemented the delta pattern, so if you for example if I would disable VSync, which would greatly improve the frames per second from sixty to probably four hundred when I'm recording right now. The movements are still as fast as with VSync. Okay, now the trigonometry. Let's yeah, let's show that. So you can move forward by easy, either using the up arrow key or the W key, and you can move backwards by pressing the S key or the back arrow key. And the same goes for left and right, and I've also implemented strafing. I don't know if there are more methods to do this. There sure are. But what I did was, let's see. Strafing, 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 strafing. Uh, here. So I have all these, these booleans, and they say if the key is up, down, left, right, because... Um, yeah, I, I want to have that in one moment. I want. Uh, I don't want to check this all the time because that's much slower. And by that time, I might have released the key, resulting in a crash or even worse. So you can see key up, keyboard is key down, key up, or W S A D. And I've also added space to fly up and shift to fly down left control to move faster and tab to move slower and how I did this was yeah, I had this variable called walking speed and yeah this is basically the trigonometry I used for for the stuff where you have your angle and then you move along that angle so it's kind of basic trigonometry, but it did take me a very long time, so I guess I'll just gloss over it here. Oh yeah, and these terms are Dutch, because, yeah, I get mathematics in Dutch. This was a lot easier if I translated it to Dutch. Of course, this will mean nothing to you, because you're not Dutch. So I have the angle. I get that from my rotation along the y-axis. So, yeah, that's basically if I look to the ref left or to the right. And this is actually a very bad example because this is already strafing here. So if I'm holding the up key and I'm not holding any of the other keys, I set the angle to the rotation Y. And then I set position to an, the current position. So I clone the current position. And then I compute all the different um, the different lines of the triangle you could say so yeah this is trigonometry I probably can't explain it all too well in English because I yeah as I said before I get mathematics in Dutch not in English so feel free to download this after the video and then look through it at your own pace Okay, now let's see anything else. Oh yeah, I also had an added resizability for the display, meaning I can now resize it like this and that. And there was actually a bug I encountered in which um, I didn't cast the display dot get width and get height to floats, resulting in yeah a bug. So if I show it right here. So if we're full screen and we're not, uh, wait, this is not what we want. Uh, if display is resized, I'm looking for that. Yeah, yeah. So if I emit this float stuff here, you can see. Now it looks fine like this, but if I do something like this happens. 
Okay. So bear in mind, typecast the float when you're doing GLU perspective calls like that. And one, one very important thing to note is that I used the vector 3f from the slick util library to store my position and my rotation. And I'm using the default OpenGL coordinate system in 3D by generated by GLU perspective to map the positions and then the rotations. Yeah, same. So position x plus would be to the right, y plus would be up, z plus would be um, into the camera, so z minus would be out of the camera, so walking forward. And this actually resembles the Minecraft coordinate system because Minecraft uses OpenGL and Notch couldn't be bothered to add a separate coordinate system. So yeah, I also have the grid size which I can adjust to much larger proportions. So now you can't see the edges, but now you can if I, I hope so at least. Hmm. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, now we have the fog. Fog near fo fog fire. I use the OpenGL fixed function pipeline to do this. And you can also adjust the fog color. So 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8 would be a light grayish color, as you can see here. Let's go to the fog code. So you can actually see I create a float buffer with fog colors and it holds all the colors I declared with the fog color variable. And then it sets the clear color to that fog color as well. So yeah, that's so it has the fog and then at the end when it clears it's still that color so no weird stuff happens flip the buffer so it's readable and then I call the GL fog methods which set all the fog parameters okay here's the texture loading with PNG decoder although it's it's kind of simple well maybe except for the GL text parameter I this is the stuff you need to do to get the nice blocky stuff for example, if I would put linear here, it would be blurry again. It was blur blurry before. Yeah, so now it's like this, which we don't want. There we go. Also, the display lists don't actually bind the textures themselves. I let... Um, I just did that myself here in the main loop, so as you can see I bind the texture and then I unbind the texture here for the object. Oh yeah, and the mouse. The mouse and its rotation stuff mapping. So let's see if I can... There we go. No, that was horrible. There. So if our mouse is grabbed, which it is currently, then we create a new variable called mouse dx, which is basically yeah this, left to right, and then mouse dy, which is this. And we make that dependent of the mouse speed, and then we multiply it by a factor which makes it normal, quote unquote. So here we say if rotation y plus mouse dx is larger than 360, so if we do something like this, it resets it back to zero. So the values always range between zero, including zero, and 360. And then for the mouse dx, you can't actually go further than, than the top, so there's no need for that. And they actually also added a maximum look up and maximum look down, which I already told you before. So yeah, this is the code for rotation x, rotation y. It's not that hard to understand. Is there something else? Oh yes, probably very important. Is that 
is how I translate the stuff with the matrices and stuff. So first I load the identity matrix, because I want to start fresh, start clean. And then I rotate F rotation X along the X axis, Y along the X axis, uh, Y axis, and then Z along the Z axis. And I actually don't use the rotation.z right now, but that would be for something like um, tilting to the left or to the right. Actually, do that right now. That's pretty cool. Rotation dot c is ten. Let's see what it does. <laughs> so yeah, as you can see, I now tilted the camera. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And then I use the translate f to translate to my position: position x, position y, and position z. So, although it is a staggering 625 lines of code, it's actually not that difficult to understand, and most of it is just standard uh, OpenGL in Java. Okay, I hope you liked the video, and see you next time. Bye.